the protest that changed China. It scared the living daylights out of the party central command. Ten years after Tiananmen Square, it's the eve of the millennium, and 10,000 people silently gather in front of the homes of China's leaders. They come quietly, and they leave quietly, but their voice has been heard. It put Falun Gong on the map as a force in China. Three months later, the crackdown. Thousands are arrested, tortured, and killed. It's the beginning of a genocide that continues today. The decision that uh, they will ban Falun Gong, the decision was made on April 25th. But what made those silent protesters spend that April day in peaceful appeal? What sparked the brutal crackdown that would follow? And why has the world stayed mostly silent about the nightmare that many Falun Gong practitioners have endured throughout the past decade? The other man said, beating Falun Gong to death is nothing and is counted as suicide. I said, even if you beat me to death, I will not tell you anything. This is their story. A story of courage amid condemnation. A story of old brutality beneath the veneer of a new China. The story of Falun Gong. I got there around 8 a.m. Shi Tsai Dong now lives in New York and can be seen practicing Falun Gong on weekends at Manhattan's Madison Square Park. On April 25, 1999, he was a Chinese citizen who had a chance to meet the country's second most powerful person. There were already a lot of people. A lot of practitioners had already arrived. From their attire, it looked like they were from the rural areas around Beijing. Most of them had come for one reason, to make an appeal on behalf of their practice at China's Central Appeals Office. Schur says he just came after hearing that fellow Falun Gong adherents had been arrested in the neighboring city of Tianjin, arrested for doing what he was doing now, making a simple appeal. After I found out, I thought that we needed to appeal to government departments about the situation, tell them that Tianjin practitioners should not have been arrested merely because they went to appeal. In Tianjin, they were protesting against what they said was biased press coverage by the state-run media. But taking the appeal to Beijing raised the stakes. Right next to the Central Appeals Office was the central leadership compound of Zhongnanhai, the most sensitive place in China. Surrounded by walls and armed guards, it houses the homes and offices of China's leaders. As more practitioners came to the neighboring appeals office, they too ended up all around the compound. I turned around and I saw Zhu Rongji came out from the other side of the gate. I had passed the gate, so I quickly turned around and went back. It's very hard to get an audience with Zhu Rongji, even for a second. A very interesting detail is that Zhu Rongji was uh, coming out without any bodyguard. So it is a clear signal that he know that Falun Gong people uh, are very peaceful. Uh, because I can even saw his smile on his face. He said, if you have any problems, find representatives and I'll discuss with them. I raised my hand and said, Premier Zhu, I can go. Many other practitioners also wanted to go in. So assistants next to Ju pick three people to return to Zhongnanhai. Unless it's those ruling the country, only a handful of people ever enter Zhongnanhai. Access is limited to China's political elite and the occasional foreign dignitary. Perhaps it was a sign the party would truly listen to their concerns. So we entered Zhongnanhai following his lead. He then said that he would ask the commissioner of the State Bureau for letters and visits and the State Consul Secretary General to talk to us. After we went in, Zhu Rongji left us and we stayed at the reception. Very soon after, these officials Zhu Rongji went to look for arrived. They had notebooks and were writing down notes as they asked us questions and we answered. It was at least a chance to be heard, and being met personally by the Chinese premier was beyond anyone's expectations. But the seemingly sympathetic Zhu Rongji wasn't the only one to witness the appeal. Zhu Rongji came out, if I remember correctly, that was like uh, 10 a.m., around 10 a.m. But then uh, in the afternoon, suddenly, you know, the atmosphere, you can feel the stress, because a lot of armed police suddenly ran out of Zhongnanhai and stood in front of us. 
about two meters, you know, in between uh, the armed police. They just line up in front of us. They, were, they look very serious. And then I had a feeling that Jiang Zemin was going to come out. Jiang Zemin, the president of China, the only person more powerful than Zhu Rongji, and the only one who could disagree with him. I saw two vehicles came out of Zhongnanhai. The speed was very high. The windows were tinted. You can't see inside, but the passenger can see out. The police then added another line of guards, from one to two lines of police. I saw that the situation was very tense, but we didn't feel at all scared. Why? Because we felt that we were right and just. I thought I hadn't done anything wrong. And then they just uh, drive away. It didn't come back. And then people say Jiang Zemin was in the, in the car. When Jiang Zemin saw so many people gathering outside, he freaked out. But it wasn't clear to those at the scene who was in the car as it drove off. Nothing else seemed to happen. Night fell, and the quiet protest dispersed. I think between 8 and 9 p.m. that evening, there was news that the Tianjin Falun Gong practitioners were released. It seemed like the appeal had been successful, and for almost three months, practitioners all over China thought that they had won themselves the right to believe. People thought that the Chinese government had handled it so well. For three months, on the surface, everything was calm. But beneath the surface, Jiang Zemin was getting ready to launch a nationwide ban on Falun Gong, a ban that aimed not only to wipe out the practice itself, but to imprison or kill those who dare to be associated with it. China is not a country where protests are undertaken lightly, a lesson that was brought home by 1989's Tiananmen Square massacre. But China seemed to have changed a lot in the 10 years since. In 1989, Falun Gong had never yet been spread publicly. Ten years later, 100 million people were practicing. Each morning, tens of millions of people woke up in the dark, early hours to get to practice sites by 4 a.m. so that they could finish their exercises before work. What inspired so many people to give up their beds and do slow-moving exercises in the bitter cold? Was it a fitness craze, a religious movement, or something else? My exercise site was a square in front of my school. Every morning there were three to four hundred people doing group exercises. Falun Gong is a practice of five relatively simple Qigong exercises, with a spiritual component involving following the principles of truth, compassion, and tolerance at all times. Falun Gong's basis in Buddhist and Taoist ideas reawakened memories of traditional Chinese culture memories that had been buried by the Cultural Revolution. I thought it was interesting and that their movements were very graceful, so I walked up to have a closer look. I saw a sign next to them explaining Falun Gong. After I read it, a person next to me began explaining what it was. It was a time when such scenes were occurring all over China. The Cultural Revolution that began in the 60s had seen chaos, bloodshed, and the loss of countless cultural traditions. The openness and reform policies of the 80s replaced lost traditions with the gospel of the dollar, and in this officially atheist, communist country, money-making had become the de facto state religion. While Madonna was singing Material Girl in the West, in the East there was the new saying, to get rich is glorious. But Qigong practices, above all, Falun Gong, would change everything. One of the general problems that China has today is that there's no universally accepted set of values, and there's a tremendous sense, I think, of emptiness in the lives of lots of ordinary people. Even, and even party officials, and Qigong was, was notable because it was, had an appeal right up to the very top. Falun Gong is one of many kinds of Qigong, often translated as breathing exercises or slow-moving exercises. Their traditional practices for health and spiritual development originating in ancient Chinese culture, but became popular again in the 80s. 
Like many parts of Chinese culture, though, Qigong has a supernatural element. Many Qigong schools believe that qi is a kind of energy that exists in the body and can be strengthened and controlled through practice. Yet Falun Gong was unique because it provided the spiritual principles behind the exercises. And like anything in China, it was managed by the state. And then Chinese government also set up this so-called Qigong uh, uh, research society and uh, to uh, manage all these and, uh, meditation Qigong groups. But this is uh, run by the government, by the state. In 1992, the founder of Falun Gong, Li Hongzhi, registered Falun Gong with the China Qigong Science Research Society. As Falun Gong became popular, the research society awarded Li the title Master of Qigong and later Grand Master of Qigong. For two years, Li traveled to almost every major city in China, giving lectures and teaching the exercises. In the process, Li received both awards and media attention. When I was doing the second exercise, I felt very happy in my heart. I smiled, and I would have laughed out loud if no one were around. In the winter of 94, Li's most popular book, Zhuan Falun, was published by a state-run publishing house. The book party was even held in Beijing's Public Security University. It quickly became a bestseller in Beijing as the practice continued to spread. Meanwhile, however, tensions were building between Falun Gong and the research society. In his seminars and books, Li always emphasized that no one was allowed to make money from teaching the exercises or spreading the practice, or to collect money from practitioners or accept donations. The fees for Li's lectures, which typically lasted for eight days, were also kept very low. During that time, the, um, the Qigong re Research you know, uh, Society, uh, the, or the government body, is basically uh, using all these uh, Qigong groups to make money. Uh, and that's what happens, because they, they're not really doing any uh, scientific research. Finally, in early 96, Falun Gong broke from the society altogether. In Singapore in 98, Li spoke to practitioners about the decision to leave the society. Falun Gong used to be a branch of the China Qigong Science Research Society. We discovered, however, that the Qigong Science Research Society didn't conduct any scientific research, nor did it study Qigong practices or try to understand Qigong itself. It was only making money. It used Qigong practices to make money. But leaving the society left Falun Gong at odds with the state. Uh, because in China, it's still a very tightly run society. It's a one-party system. And uh, without the state support, it's very difficult to survive. By 1996, Falun Gong was becoming more and more popular in China, but popularity would bring with it some unwanted attention. The first day when Falun Gong appeared, uh, when it was not in this scale of practicing, uh, the government was kind of happy. But when Falun Gong spread very fast, the government became alerted. Some of the first problems Falun Gong had were with the media. In 96, a national newspaper, the Enlightenment Daily, published a criticism of Falun Gong's main text, Zhuan Falun. In the West, bad press doesn't necessarily count for much. But in China, if the media had an issue with Falun Gong, that really meant that the party, or someone in the party, had an issue with Falun Gong. That's their way of doing it. During all of the political persecutions by the party, they would always start with the media and destroy their target step by step. It was the first major article criticizing Falun Gong, but it quickly became Falun Gong's first large-scale public appeal. A lot of people started to write letters to this daily newspaper, and some of the people also write to a higher uh, government official. Faced with pressure, the paper buckled. It was a pattern that would be repeated many times. An article would be published and practitioners would protest. Some would write letters while others would show up in person. In almost every case, they would get an apology, a retraction, or both. Why have some government departments in the country continued to disparage Falun Gong from 1996 until now? There has been criticism from 1996 until now. It is inconceivable. Cultivators are from all levels of society, from the party, politics, and the military. Some have been educated by the party for several decades and have a deep feeling for the party. 
Later that year, the government quietly banned all Falun Gong books from further publication. The following year, the Public Security Bureau began investigating Falun Gong practice sites. The plainclothes police officer would go to the practice site every morning. He would do a name call every morning so he would know who was there and who wasn't. The goal of the investigation was to collect evidence that Falun Gong was some kind of cult, what would be called in Chinese Xie Jiao, or evil religious teaching. But the investigation failed. Indeed, it didn't even conclude that Falun Gong could be called a new religion, strictly speaking. Falun Gong talked about traditional Chinese conceptions of gods and the heavens, but that didn't make it a religion per se. A religion for China had a building, it had ceremonies, and it had an organization. Qigong didn't. Falun Gong had a loose network of volunteers to teach the exercises, and that's about it. We called them assistants. They were volunteer coordinators at the practice sites. There was no so-called leadership. But in 1998, the Public Security Bureau was again investigating Falun Gong. They were now determined to find something, and practitioners around the country reported harassment and raids on their practice sites and homes. But the tipping point wouldn't come for another year. On April 11, 1999, a youth journal of the Tianjin College of Education published an article titled, Why Young People Should Not Practice Qigong. The article slammed all forms of Qigong and insulted Li Hongzhi. But this time, when practitioners came to appeal, the Public Security Bureau told the paper not to back down. After 11 days of stalemate, they dispatched riot police to break up the protest by force. Many people were beaten, and about 45 were arrested. As a response, practitioners appealed to the city and provincial governments, but were told it was out of their hands, and they had to take their appeals to Beijing. News of the incident quickly spread around because Beijing was close to Tianjin and Falun Gong practitioners nearby found out about this very quickly. In seven years, Falun Gong had attracted 100 million followers. Now practitioners had gathered outside the government's most powerful apparatus. It was a turning point, a critical moment in the history of modern China. In the morning, I went to the practice site. A fellow practitioner told me what happened in Tianjin. For Falun Gong, it was the last chance to stop the investigations and harassment and to lift the ban on the books. If this didn't work, there was no one else to appeal to, nowhere else to go. For the Chinese government, it was a chance to show the world that China had become a stable, modern society that wouldn't rely solely on the use of force. Later that evening, practitioners who had been arrested in Tianjin were released, and the protesters in Beijing went home. When we left, all the papers and rubbish were picked up. It was very clean. It wasn't like what you'd see in China where people were pushing and shoving. It was like the first and only time in China, after the power exchange around 1949, there was such a peaceful gathering at the most sensitive location for the government, and the matter was resolved peacefully. On April 25th, just ahead of the 10th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre, the Chinese Communist Party had ended a large-scale protest without using force. April 25th attracted a lot of attention, but it didn't put a dent in Falun Gong's popularity. For three months, everything went back to normal. It seemed like China had truly changed. And later on, after April 25th, in fact, the Chinese press also publicly saying that uh, there's no policy against Falun Gong and people have the right for freedom of meditation and the practice. But in reality, time was running out and the crackdown was getting closer and closer. But all these things changed on July 20th, uh, 1999. Next, in the face of death, why do so many stand up for their beliefs? Throughout my life, I felt I was seeking something, and I have finally found it. I felt I had come home. Inside the movement that changed China forever. Falun Gong is threatening to the Chinese leadership and the Chinese bureaucracy precisely because it stresses principles that just by naming the principles, you're insulting the Chinese bureaucracy. Particularly truth, and that's the one that has the most power. 
the story of a nation's soul. I used to feel that life was very tiresome. I guess I'm speaking spiritually, like the heart is tired. The feeling I got after reading the book was that this is how a person can live. May 13th, 13th, Soul of a Nation.